Good morning, and welcome to our second Succeed in Computer Practice webinar. Oxford University Press is delighted to have our two authors, Mario Hartnick and Brian Dill, with us this morning. They will talk you through the syllabus changes in computer practice, tell you a little bit about how Oxford can help you succeed in computer practice, present you with tips on how to deal with some common challenges in the classroom, and they will be available for questions at the end. Mario Hartnick is a TVET lecturer in computer practice N4 to N6 and has been involved and has been involved in the teaching, preparation, and organization of computer-related subjects for the Report 191 and NCV program since 2010. He's a lifelong learner with an educational background that includes a BA in Humanities, PGCE in Psychology, and an honors degree in Educational Management. He's also a certified IT Essentials Instructor. Brian Dill, is Head of Information Technology at Fairmont High School in Durbanville with two decades experience in computer education. He has authored more than 20 textbooks, both end user computing and programming books for publications in South Africa and several African countries. We'll wait a few minutes to give everyone a chance to join. I want to respect everyone's time so we won't wait too long. Just a few tips, please do keep your camera off and the microphone muted until the question and answer section towards the end. Please make use of the chat box if you have any questions that arise during the presentation. We will be monitoring those chats and we will do our best to answer those for you. Do send us your email addresses in the chat box because we will be recording this as I mentioned and we will make that available to you. We will also email you the PowerPoint slides from today's presentation. So don't forget to send us those email details. So we're just going to wait a few more minutes and then we will have Mario Hartnick starting for us. Thank you again. Hello again, everybody. Um, I think we should get going. Anybody joins a bit later, not to worry. We are recording, as mentioned, and I will make that available to everybody, as well as the PowerPoint. Without further ado, Mario Hartley. Thank you, Glenn, for that introduction, and welcome to everyone. Good morning. I'm just going to jump into it and um, I'm going to start with what will we be covering today. Um, we're going to do an overview of the changes in the syllabus. Um, that's going to be the first few slides, which will be specifics about the syllabus. They're not too in-depth, but they are just to give you guys an idea as to what to expect for the new syllabus. And then I'm also going to, after that, after the syllabus, I'm going to talk about uh, specific examples that's actually in the textbook or in the, uh, the subject book about the parts that I was responsible for and I mainly focused on the practical part of the uh, of the textbook. So basically um, the syllabus part will be about how to navigate the syllabus and then I'm going to show you some examples um, in the textbook. The theory part will be discussed by my my partner, my, my, my auth um, partner that authored the um, the um, IT sections or the, the theory sections of the textbook, which is Brian Dill, 
and um, I'll give over to him when 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 Shad's time arrives. So let's jump in. So the overview of the new syllabus, I'm going to speak about the introductory book and also the computer practice book for N4. And just so that so that we know, um, so that you know, this new curriculum will be implemented on uh, um, in January, in the first semester of 2021, which is next year. So let's 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 look at a few changes. What is new? What is in? What is out? We've been working with the 1995 syllabus so far in computer practice uh, in four, five, and six. But now the curriculum has changed, so it's going to change in 2021. And um, just to recap, what was the old syllabus about? Remember, there's five topics, and it was basically the first topic was the introduction to computers, which was mainly ICT theory. And then topic two was keyboarding. We had system software, um, topic three, which is your operating system. And then we did text manipulation, which was basically Microsoft Word. And we did spreadsheets, which is um, Excel. Now the new syllabus in 2021 going to have quite a few changes. Again, we're going to have five topics, but they are they are they are packed. The first topic, for example, in 2021 or the new syllabus of 2021, is basically the first all the five topics of of the uh, of the old syllabus. The only difference is PowerPoint gets added to that mix, and then we have topics two, three, four, and five, which is all new topics. Brian will talk about that. Um, so it's more IT related uh, ICT concepts like your networking and communication skills, your data information management, um, internet and communication skills, digital citizenship, and um, computational thinking. There's a lot of computational thinking that's going to be part of the new syllabus. Again, Brian will talk about what that actually entails. Now, to, to give you guys an idea as to why, not necessarily why the syllabus changed, but what is the goal of the new syllabus? Um, I want to illustrate this, this picture in front of you, which is about uh, a house. And if I start right at the top there, the goal of this syllabus is so that we can create digitally proficient citizens. We want to make digitally proficient citizens of the students that we teach. In other words, after they are done with a computer practice and introductory um, computer practice course, they should be able to function in a digitally advanced society. So that was that's the goal of this whole thing. And how is that going to happen? If I go right to the bottom of the house, the fun, the foundation, um, they're going to do that by by learning and um, practicing ICT fundamentals. So that's where we're going to start. And that's where the theory content really comes into play. It is building that foundation so that we can then be exposed to the walls and the windows of this syllabus, which is the middle part, which is your content of the syllabus in the textbook, where we're going to do compute computing concepts, your networking, basically the theory and IT sections as well, so that the student can learn e-skills. And this is very important because, as I mentioned earlier, integration of these different concepts and topics is going to be a major theme throughout the syllabus and in the textbooks. So, so that is the point of this whole thing. Now I'm going to continue by talking a little bit more about the syllabus. And here the next slide is about the um, practical or basically the new programs that we're going to be encountering in the new syllabus. Word is still going to be there, spreadsheets are still going to be there, but presentation software and notebooks are coming into play. Now you don't have to worry about notebooks just yet. Um, or OneNote, that's only coming in in five and in six. So there's still a lot of time to practice your skills concerning that. But for the N4 syllabus, or for the introductory part of the syllabus, um, PowerPoint will not be there. But for the computer practice part, PowerPoint will definitely be there. So we're going to do word processing, spreadsheets, and presentation software for N4. 
And when we get to N5, we're going to deal with notebooks and database. Database, however, is not going to be discussed like it was in the previous syllabus um, as an actual program that they needed to understand doing queries and reports. The main focus of the database function in the new syllabus is it's really just about the, the table, the, um, the data filing, because there's a lot of, as I mentioned, integration going to happen. So you're going to have to be able to, the students are going to have to be able to create the data file and then be able to use that data file in, a, in an Excel program or a, a Word program because mail merge is, is still there, is still part of the syllabus. At the bottom part of the slide, you will see that um, as per the original report, that basically means I did not change. It's still 113 hours uh, over 17 weeks, um, which 85 of that hours should be dedicated to contact hours. And um, if it's part time students, um, at least 51 um, hours should be students. So, here we have just an example of the ICARES. How the ICARES are going to change and change. Now, remember, currently we only have three assessments, which is your task, your test, and your internal exam. And the task is 20% towards your year mark. The test is 30% and then you have your internal exam, which is 50%. Now that we all know. But now from next year onwards, new and force, that is going to change. Even though it looks ex even though it looks very much very different from what we are used to, there are actually very familiar elements still um, packed in there. Like for example, as you can see there, we're going to have four assessments instead of three. But if you look closely, we have the first one, we're still going to do an assignment. And that's going to probably happen right in the beginning of the semester. At that stage, we don't expect students to know too much yet. So it's going to be very elementary and it's going to be topics one, two, four and five that will be discussed and very elementary document formatting. So basically word needs to happen there and that's going to be spread over two week period and it only comes 10 percent of your I case mark. Now, just to come back to what I'm, but but still 40-60 ratio, I just want to explain what that means, if you remember. Um, the I cares um, counts only 40%, or they need to achieve 40% to um, be eligible to go and write their final exam. So that that's still the same, it didn't change, so they're still going to need 40%. They're still going to need to pass um, the I cares at 40% to be allowed to go and write their final exam. Going back to my example, so I just discussed the, the assignment and then after the assignment, again, they're going to do a test. That's again, very familiar, but by the time they do the test, now it's going to be, they need to know a little bit more. 50% um, of it should be practical components. So it's more application that's going to happen there and it's 15% towards their eye cares. But here's where the new thing comes in, number three the practical assessment task. And as you can see that nationally set. Um, that is that is absolutely new. That is something very new. But at this stage, I can't elaborate too much on that. I myself am not too sure how that will happen, but I'm sure DHET will give us guidance regarding that. Then number four, we have our internal examination. Nothing new about that. It's going to be very similar to what we've done so far. By that time, students need to add, need to know at least 80% of the content that they have spent through um, in the um, semester. So that will happen right at the end of the semester, very close to the final exam. So that's still very same. That's still very much the same. So four assessments instead of of three assessments. So just be aware of that. I'm going to go now to my next slide where I'm going to, we're just going to quickly look at what is new um, in the introductory um, book and what is new in the uh, computer practice book. The parts that are in yellow are basically brand new and the parts that are in black is 
familiar concepts. They they updated versions of the I the um, the ICT concepts and the, uh, the theory concepts, but they are basically familiar to should be familiar to you. So we have our introductory book where we're going to start with our introduction to computing concepts and system technologies, personal computers, and how they are used. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm basically going to just speak about the yellow parts in more detail, just to give you an idea. But again, Brian, the second author, will be talking about those modules in more detail. So number three there, we're going to have a new concept, introduction to computational thinking. These are going to be discussed when we talk about when I'm going to show you examples about case studies, for example, in the book, those deal a lot with computational thinking and what that actually means. Number nine, 10 or modules 9, 10, 11, 12 and 13, they are all new. So they are the I, the IT or ICT concepts that we are now going to also um, work into the, the syllabus or the syllabus wants us to work that into our our content. Work when we look at the computer practice in four textbooks again, number eight there, presentation software. I spoke about that. PowerPoint is is now part of computer practice, and we're going to welcome him to the computer practice family. We're still going to have file management, keyboarding, words processing, spreadsheets. They're still there. Um, but they probably are going to be assessed in, in a different manner than what we have been used to so far. Um, again, the theory section is very similar to the, to the um, intro book, but um, also different. I'm going to move on now to the requirements of the syllabus and the Department of Higher Education and Training. As you obviously have noted, the software is going to change. Um, your operating system needs to be updated. Um, currently, we're working with um, Windows 10. So if you have any earlier software systems loaded onto your PCs, I would advise the college to at least get um, the latest operating system loaded. Then we have the Microsoft Office, which includes word processing, spreadsheets, notebook, database, and an email application for the use of Office 365. I'm going to speak about Office 365 in a little bit um, in the next few slides. Um, note, the exam will be based on the last two available versions of the software. Now, they're talking there about the updated Office software. Currently, the latest Microsoft Office software is, is, is 2019. But this book specifically were created by using Office 365. It's actually not called Office 365 anymore. It's now called Microsoft 365. But I will discuss that in, in a moment. And then, of course, you need to have your updated web browsers there. Currently, we're working with the Internet Explorer. Microsoft Edge is the latest Microsoft browser that is available. And of course, we have Chrome, which is your Google browser. And always make sure that you have the latest version up or the updated version loaded onto your PC. Um, PDF re readers, very important because there's going to be some instances where, for example, like in OneNote, where the assessments are going to ask the student to save the document or the page or the or the notebook in a PDF format. Or there's going to be examples or, or instances where the student is going to be asked in the mock exams, for example, to use a PDF, to go and open a PDF and look at examples and create, recreate or save it in a PDF form or import or export. So make sure that the PDF readers are available. Um, luckily, they're easy to download, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So your, and then your compression and extraction software is also very important. This is your zip folders, etc. Type of software. Make sure that it's available.
Sorry about that, everybody. Just give us a few minutes. We're having a technical situation here. We will be back with you shortly. That's part of the new syllabus, huh? problem solving. Yeah. Thank you for your patience, everybody. We're just um, practicing a bit of problem solving as per the computer practice. So computer this, practice. And unfortunately, Mario was dropped, and he's going to carry on presenting um, as Brian. Um, so don't put too much of this. It's from Brian's profile, but it's actually Mario, and he's going to continue now. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm really sorry about that. The gremlin visited us this morning. Um, anyway, so I'm going to talk about the Microsoft 365 or I'll continue talking about the Microsoft 365 software um, and why we used it. Um, as I mentioned, the textbook is written according to the Microsoft Office 365 software. And there is an educational version available to all colleges. So you can actually access it as a college or buy it as a college. It's a, basically it's a subscription service, um, which is different from your what we are use, what we've been used to as a um, Microsoft Office box uh, version of, of the software. Um, there, uh, for example, as, as the college updates its Office software, like for example, 2016 plus, Microsoft Office 365 will always be the updated or latest version. So that is quite, that's, that's a nice little feature that we've worked, that we've decided on to use rather Office 365 instead of just a normal, a normal box version like your Office 2016 or currently 2019. What nice is about the subscription service is you can actually share the um, Microsoft 365 subscription with all your other devices, like your PC, your laptop, your phone, by just using one subscription. And the content of this book is 100% on par with the latest version of the Office software, which is um, Office 365. But at the same time, even though it is Microsoft 365 versus 2016 or 2019, it's basically the same thing. One is just a subscription service and the other one is a box service. Same content with maybe slight little changes. On the right hand side, I have a little uh, picture there just to show you what the Microsoft 365 um, software offers if you do get it. Um, OneDrive, which is a cloud service. You have your, your, still your, your, all your, your programs, your Word, your Excel, your PowerPoint, OneNote. They're all there with a few other nice little software features, to-do lists, calendars, Skype, et cetera, et cetera, and quite a lot more if you increase your subscription service, of course. So that's about that. That's all about Microsoft 365. Just note that the book is based on Microsoft 365 and it will always be the updated version. And then just to sum up, 
there's an educational version available to all the colleges for free. Is it free? Yeah. yeah. Kind of. <laughs> Let's move on. So we have our learning material support section. The books focus on integration and it covers the syllabus. And the application sections are all integrated with the theory sections. That is a that is definitely one thing that the, the syllabus actually kind of works towards is that the same the, or the similar concepts that you're going to learn about in your theory sections actually gets used or the you understand the application sections um, better or they there's some point the two come together like for example if you you're going to talk about cloud software and your, in your IT sections and then you're actually going to use cloud software you're going to have to save things in the cloud and you have to kind of retrieve things etc etc so it's also written or the books are also written in a hands-on step-by-step instruction manner i'm going to talk about that also a bit later i'm going to show you an example what i mean by that um it's printed in full color and it's ring bound easy to use you know uh, in a computer lab where you have sometimes really limited space you have more computer than you actually have workspace so the books makes that easy and I am proud to, to say this, we are DHET approved and we're on the catalog. So it's, it's there, we're there. Um, make use of, we also make use of many PowerPoint and website referrals throughout the, not, yeah, basically in our lecture guide and our um, PowerPoints, we make use of a lot of website referrals and to assist the student in the lecture, especially in an offline capacity. Um, and we focus, we're gonna focus on ongoing, ongoing support and um, there's a lot of input content that will be placed on our learning zone. Again, I will talk about the learning zone in a bit um, as well. So how are we going to navigate the new syllabus? How does the new textbook, or how will the new textbook help students and lecturers? Let's see. Now here I have a nice little picture of what the book technically looks inside. Um, you can see how nice and colorful it is. It's easy on the eyes, easy to read, easy to follow. But more importantly, um, it's still an academic subject book. So we have, we start off with our, we start off with our, our unit and our headings. We have a little bit of a content. We have a, a nice little colorful illustration there. Um, but even though, and then we continue with the actual content, but to support that content, we still have our uh, definition boxes or we, we have this defini definition boxes. We have um, did you know boxes to explain concepts further. On the second page of that picture, you will also see the power break. Um, so after each hard topic has been discussed um, in, in detail, um, we do ask students to quickly do a power break just to test their knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. But I will talk about that also for power breaks in a moment. Here we have a module opener, an example of a module opener where we have um, our units that's broken up in units, the learning objectives, the key terms uh, when you start off your module. So you don't, just, you don't just start off in the middle of nowhere. There's a clear guide as to what will be this, what is this unit, what is this module about? What are the units broken into? What is the objectives going to be and what is the key terms? And the point of that is to link to the syllabus or link with the syllabus. That's the whole point of it. That's how we that's how you know that this is something that is in the syllabus. It's something that you should know and where to find it or what the topics are going to be about, the subject outcomes, etc. Okay, assessment, which is your power break. On the left hand side there, uh, there's an example of a power break, but that is specifically a, uh, a PowerPoint power break. 
Um, and we are all familiar with, 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 with assessments throughout a textbook. There needs to be assessments. That's the way that the students are able to learn, basically, and to test their new skills. So you must, you can use these um, power breaks in class with your students. They're easy to follow. Um, they practice the new skills. Um, I would advise to demonstrate the power break to the students. Do it yourself through your lesson. You can actually teach by using a power break, and then you ask the students to do it on their own. Um, so all the activity files of the power breaks are available for the lecturer. Um, uh, I'm sorry, all the activities and the data files and the soft copies are available. It's placed in a CD that comes with the book, um, but it's also placed on the learning zone, so you would be able to download it from the learning zone. And if in whatever weird situation you, you don't have the CD and you can't download from the learning zone, you, you can always contact um, Oxford and your um, sales consultant and they will make a plan to get it to you. That, it's definitely not going to be a problem. If there's any more specific questions uh, of anything that I've spoken about so far, and maybe I went too, too fast, but if, um, whatever the case may be, of course, just make a note and you can ask me um, at the end of the session. But I'm just going to continue. Um, we have our Power, PowerPoint lessons. Now, these are, okay, so the PowerPoint lessons, they are, they were created by the authors for each module. And what makes them special is you can, they are ready to use and they come with really good examples, practical links to, to websites, YouTube, etc., as you teach or as you go through your lesson. Now, if I look at the example on my left, um, I don't know if you can see it there, but if we look at slide number, number six, where you first, well, slides one, two, three, and four and five, they were basically the introduction to that module as you're going to start your lesson. And then you get to slide number six, where the instruction is, let's now open Microsoft Word. When you open Microsoft Word, now we're going to discuss the, the interface of Microsoft Word. We're going to discuss the new numerical keys, and then we're going to look at a video, but which is basically that, again, introduces the same concepts that we've now discussed. And at some point, it's also, the slide's also going to tell you, now you do a power break, et cetera, et cetera. So use the power break lessons. They were specifically created by the authors for you in mind, you the lecturer, to make your teaching easier. And then I spoke about this earlier, self-guided explanations. With previous textbooks, I am a, a computer practice lecturer myself. I've been teaching CP for a while now. And I must say that sometimes what was lacking in other textbooks were clear instructions, clear guided instructions, how to do something on your own, where you don't necessarily need a lecture in front of you. So let's say, for example, a student um, is sick or whatever the case may be, can't for that week or two that you were doing a topic, couldn't be at college. Well, they, you can just ask them to do an activity. And if they get stuck, refer them to page X, where it actually explains will be able, where they actually will be able to read and the section will explain step by step um, to them how to do a specific thing. And as a support to that could be the PowerPoint slides where they are referred to video content, either of yourself or YouTube videos. So that was also a theme. That's also a theme throughout the textbook that we really went and we focused on how will the student be able to use this book on their own, without the help of a lecturer necessarily. Okay. 
end of the module. The end of the module ends with a, re um, we're going to do a revisiting learning objective there at each module. It's basically um, a checklist for, for you to go and check, or for the student and for yourself to go and check, um, do I understand this concept? Yes or no? And if I don't understand the concept, then I need to go back and revisit the concept. All right. Case studies are there. We have assessments there. Um, at the end of each module, again, to test your knowledge. And as I mentioned earlier, the case studies are specifically, or not specifically, but they the, the computational thinking, the integration, they are all worked into the case studies, which are, or yeah, they are um, real life examples that you, you ask a student to solve a problem, for example, an office situation, how will they now solve a problem based on the new skills that they have learned. The learning zone, mentioned this also earlier, it's free to prescribing lectures. In other words, buy the book, you get it for free, um, or otherwise register on the, the learning zone. Students can do the same. Um, they can go and get extra content there, and it will definitely help, help them to improve their marks. And for the lecturers, use the content that's there, extra resources, videos, um, to enhance your teaching experience and to make your life, again, easier. Lecture guide. Um, as per any lecture guide, that's the place where you go and find your specific answers, um, topics to weightings, your teaching um, plan. And what's really nice about this is the teaching suggestions that's going to be in the lecture guide. Real life, exa not examples, real life experience that, uh, that we've put into the book from our experience in class of how to enhance your lessons as well. And there's a, there I have an example of a teaching plan um, each college usually has to set up their own work schedule, so you can use that specific teaching plan to create your work scheme from. So it's already there for you, waiting for you. And then um, here's an example of the teaching suggestions that I spoke about, where after each module, you can actually read about how to approach a specific module, um, et cetera, et cetera. And also where to get more content from, from the authors specifically. The mock exams, um, yeah, I have an example of the mock exam, um, which is a practical question of an uh, in four question paper that we created. And one thing that I can definitely specific can tell you about is that the um, these uh, mock exams were, were were created with sound advice from, from the curriculum advisors. Um, so one you will find at the back of the book, and another one you will find um, uh, as a soft copy on the CD and also on the learning zone. And it's definitely set up according to the syllabus guidelines. I have a nice little example there, but that comes from an intro book where you can see what the question paper or the final question paper will be assessing. Um, section A is topics one to five, which is basically theory sections. Again, Brian will speak about that. And then section B is your practical sections, which will, which is word, typing, spreadsheets, file management. Um, and then we, when you get to CP or computer practice in four, um, PowerPoint is worked into, into it. And I think, yeah, file management will then also be um, excluded and replaced by, by, by spreadsheets. Um, moving on, again, sample exam papers with solutions. That is an example of what a theory section, the section A looks like with a marking grid um, on your right-hand side there. As you can see, that clearly shows you what the answers should be, or what is it, what is it going to, where do they get the answers for the mark from, how much marks that count, and then what was the student's actual mark. You fill it in on your grid and eventually give the student a mark. The way of assessing is going to change, but again, there are going to be new uh, workshops to to really um, um, teach you guys how to do do it. Um, so. I said marking grids. We're going to start working with marking grid, grids. The lecture guide includes suggestions to marking grids. There's an example of a marking grid. I showed you this earlier, but that's a more practical example. Um, does the report include that? Um, was there an explanation? How many marks and what was the actual mark achieved? Um, Evaluation checklist, checklist, the lecture guide includes suggested checklists for the informal assessments and open-ended tasks. There's an example of what that would look like. 
but you can explore these all on your own. Um, uh, it's in your lecture guide. You can go and explore it and see for yourself how to work through that. And then I'm just going to quickly run through some of the um, problems that we sometimes face in class um, for students and for lecturers. And just to remind you guys, you know, with this new syllabus, we, we need to keep this in mind. Um, when a student comes, especially when they're in four, they register for the first time, many of them have not seen a PC or they haven't worked on a PC um, before that. So keep that in mind. There's usually a sense of fear, fear of the computer. And if you can work, you know, to eliminate that fear from the beginning, that would be fantastic. It's going to make your, your, your life just easier throughout the semester. Um, time is usually also an issue, especially this curriculum is packed. But there is guidance in the syllabus how to deal with this. Like, for example, when you, when you plan the timetable, make sure that there is enough contact hours Put into the timetable, but still adhering to the note to the to the teaching um, hours and time available. Um, another issue that students sometimes have: they don't read the the instructions properly. So teach them to read the instruction properly. Do what is asked, not do what you think you should do. Solutions: um, I, I actually mentioned some of them. Assure that um, the student won't be able to break the PC. Assure them they won't be able to do that. Let them touch, press, and explore the PC for themselves before you actually start teaching. Just get to know what am I working with this machine. And then let them introduce themselves to the class in the beginning so that you, the lecturer, can get also an idea of who you are dealing with. Um, let them tell you what is their PC experience, where do they come from, what is their situation been, so that you can know who you are working with and what you need to do and how hard you need to work um, throughout the semester. Keyboarding is also crucial in to help with time management. Students tend to be, especially in four, still very slow. So keyboarding in the beginning, especially during registration period for that first few weeks, make sure that you practice the keyboarding and there's a whole module on keyboarding in both books. So make sure that you definitely either start with that module or really work intensively doing the speed rolls, doing the, the typing uh, exercises and just to help them speed up and, 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 and get to know the keyboard better. Shortcut keys. A lot of lecturers don't tend to focus on shortcuts. If you teach your students shortcuts from the beginning, and there's, again, a whole section in the textbook about shortcuts, will make your life easier. And then, of course, from the beginning, even though it's something that happens at the end of a semester, make sure that you teach your students or show them what a actual question paper look like so that they can know what to expect and what they are actually working towards. Um, I kind of mix them up now. I spoke about some lecture issues and student issues at the same time, but just to recap, patience, make sure that you are, you cannot be a computer lecturer if you are not patient. Be patient. Um, upgrade your skills. Sometimes lecturers, they are not, when they start teaching CP for the first time, they don't necessarily have all the skills and experience yet, but that is up to them. They, you re, but if you know that you are not, you don't have a lot of the skills yet, there's nothing stopping you from exploring those skills. Um, there's sometimes also a lack of support and guidance from, from, from other people in the department that's already been teaching the subject. And it's really their responsibility to make sure that they guide you and teach you um, some of the skills that they've acquired throughout the years. Network. If you can network with other colleges, other campuses, other colleagues, do that. So you will be amazed at the amount of content skills and knowledge that you would be able to learn from these people. Um, work with your IT guy. Make sure that you have good relations with your IT guy. They are the people that's going to keep um, your computers, you know, running like clockwork. Um, and then another problem that we do have is also the semester is usually very short. It's a reality. It's supposed to be six months, but in reality, there is there's some um, holidays in between. There's um, there's an exam at the end, and there's a registration period in the beginning. All of these things cut 
um, down your, your, your actual teaching time. But make sure that you work in extra content by, off, by working offline. Start implementing online teaching as much as you can. I am not going to go through all the solutions. I actually touched uh, on them already. Um, you can go through these ones on your own when the slides are available and um, I'm available for comment afterwards uh, if there's anything that you would like me to talk about. So thank you so much for listening. I'm going to give over to Brian now and I am looking forward to answering some of your questions at the end. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to share some ideas and thoughts about the theory component um, of the syllabus and just some ideas just to carry on from, from where Mario um, was talking about the practical component that the theory component is just as important and because the syllabus is written in such a way that it does the practical content first with some of the theory integrated and then all the new theory comes afterwards in the syllabus structure um, our book has followed that same structure to ensure that we have covered every single aspect of the syllabus which we have um, it's I, one should be careful that you don't leave the theory to the end and then run out of time and don't give it its due, its due focus. Um, a suggestion would be to actually alternate the practical and the theory a little bit during your teaching week. Um, if you do large chunks of theory, um, the students could disengage a bit because they, they tend to enjoy the practical part more. So you need to make the theory as exciting and as interesting as possible for them. Um, also, in terms of, of computer lab time, the, if the students do not have access to computers at home, it's going to be difficult for them to do the power breaks and things at home, and you're going to need maximum lab time for them to work there. So do things like let them do the theory power breaks at home because they don't need to do, um, do that on a computer. And then what we've done in the book, and, and what I suggest here is use real examples when you are teaching theory especially if you have students that have never encountered computers before um, so if you're teaching computer networks have old network cards they have an old switch they have cables there that they can actually handle them and touch them and see what they actually are um, use um, youtube and and use the clips that, the links that we've also provided for you for the different theory sections um, so what has changed, Mario has already spoken about quite a few of them. Um, I'm just going to briefly tell you what they're all about. The, the networks and communications technologies, we, we live in a world today where we are actually using networks all the time. When we are on our smartphones, we have access to the internet and the whole World Wide Web all the time, 24-7. And through that, we are using computer networks. And so it's important for a computer student to understand a little bit about that background. This is, this is um, at a fairly high level. Um, in, by that, I mean it doesn't go into the nitty gritty technical details that a computer technician would need to know, a network technician would know. It's a broad overview so that people have an idea of the components and how they work and the roles that they play. Then comes um, information management and computational thinking. I'm going to spend a little bit more time on that just now because I think that might be um, the aspect that, that could be a little bit daunting. Um, I just want to reassure you that it's, it's not computer programming. It's something that we actually do every single day of our lives. It's just been broken down into steps and been given names. But it's a process that we actually subconsciously follow every single day when we solve problems and come up with solutions. Then there's internet and the communication skills. Again, that is something that a 21st century citizen uses all the time. And so we do need to know a little bit about how to use best, how to get the best results, how to communicate effectively, and those are all covered in the syllabus. And linked to that is digital citizenship. 
how can we use all of this technology, the internet and everything that it provides and networks and everything that they provide in a responsible way and in a safe way. Then um, what we've done in the textbook is we link that theory to everyday life as far as possible. So where we descri describe a new concept, we try and make it more accessible for the students by relating it to something that they experience in their lives every day anyway. Um, the example shown here is on e-waste from the book. And we speak there about the fact that many people have old mobile phones at home. They might still work, but they're lying in a drawer and they don't know what to do with them. And the book deals with what do you do with them responsibly. In, um, what we've also done is all of our descriptions where possible, uh, descriptions of processes and things like that. We have supported them with pictures and charts and diagrams to make them easier to understand. For example, we have in text the steps that are followed when a computer accesses a web page, but we also have it in diagrammatic form because many students are visual learners and so it makes it easier for them to access and to understand. And there's just a different example here on how a search engine works supported by a diagram with the most important points just below it. In the theory has been broken up into smaller sections, again, to make it more accessible. And just as Mario also previously showed you some pages from the textbook with the topic here, search engines, there's the content, there's the definition boxes, followed by the you know box and the power break immediately after that before we go into the new concept so that you can check that you have got all the content under control. And then let's talk a little bit about um, problem solving and computational thinking. So um, again, throughout the book, even outside the module dealing with computational thinking, we have based many of the activities in real life examples so that the student can relate to it more easily. Um, and it gradually introduces them to this process of computational thinking without them actually realizing it. So here's just an example of a particular question and it's set in a real life example with things that people might experience in their everyday lives and the answers are linked to that scenario. We also have case studies and, and the situation questions at the end of the modules. And so they, it places again the theory that the student has learned within a context from a real life scenario. And it actually tests the content, but in a friendlier way because it's done um, within this kind of real life context. And computational thinking itself. Um, it will be a new concept for many people, and it's completely covered um, very, very thoroughly in this section. Um, each new concept is explained with the activities before moving on to a new concept. So here is an example. Um, one of the first um, concepts in computational thinking is pattern recognition. So there is a definition for it. There is a diagram. Um, giving an example of easy pattern recognition with shapes and things like that. Um, and you um, led through the solution to that. Then um, that pattern recognition ties in with a pattern recognition that happens in mathematics. So there's a more mathematical example. And again, a diagram to, to talk you through the steps and the most important points in this concept. And then in computational thinking, um, we then also do a power break to reassure everybody and to test that uh, you have mastered all the concepts for that particular aspect um, of computational thinking. And then we move on to the next one. Um, there are um, worked examples within this computational thinking section. And what we've done, it's quite an extensive task. Um, the worked example shows you how to go about solving a problem using computational thinking. So here's an example from the book. 
um, which is something that IT people face quite often, how to choose the best printer. So there's specifications on a whole number of printers and the worked example leads you through the process of choosing the best one of the four printers for the criteria for this particular example. And so it takes you through step by step the computational thinking process. Decomposition is one of those processes. Here in italics is just a quick definition again. And then we show how this particular problem is broken down. And then it goes to the next step, which is pattern recognition. Again, a short definition and how it's applied to this particular problem. Same for abstraction. And, and so you get led through this whole um, process. Um, it involves, it integrates practical work with the theory. So in this particular example, one of the, the tasks is, is creating a poster, such as the one that we show here. Um, and then there's also a spreadsheet that has to be created in order to make this decision, this choice on the best printer. And that is it from me, folks. Um, I think it's open for question time now. Thanks very much, Brian. I don't see any questions in the chat box. So if you have anything for our authors, please do go ahead and either type the question in the chat box or unmute and the floor is yours. If you have not yet um, entered your email address into the chat box, please do so. That way we will ensure that you receive our voice from today. And we'll also send you, send you a recording. Um, do you have one, one, one. See, there is a question about sample question papers for the new syllabus. We do have that. There is one sample in the book and one on the CV.